Uh, I'm John Couture. I'm the Commercial Fisheries Liaison Coordinator uh, for the Unamaga Institute of Natural Resources. And I'm in BC at the uh, uh, gathering of communities discussing uh, amendments to the uh, Fisheries Act and inclusion of inshore fleet and the uh, inclusion of uh, future generations of fish harvesters and the ability to gain access through uh, quotas and co-ops uh, and the uh, breakup of the corporate ownership of most stocks of wild fish in this coast. Can you give me a, a very short overview of your presentation yesterday? <laughs> Well, I, I guess my uh, presentation, was, which was mostly uh, anecdotal, was um, describing the differences between Atlantic and, and uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific <laughs> uh, because there is a significant difference. Uh, first off, uh, you know, my, my uh, territory, which is really Nova Scotia, and primarily eastern uh, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, uh, or Unamagi, is uh, specific in, in its one uh, band. It's it's one nation. It's it's the Mi'kmaq Nation. There's 13 bands or communities, depending on how you want to voice it or, or describe it. Uh, but overall, they they uh, fall under a traditional Grand Council of hereditary chiefs, and of course, those that have been established under the Indian Act with you know, regional chiefs and, and territorial chiefs. Um, and our lead chief Terry Paul is a, a brilliant leader. He uh, has done so much in, in establishing the the. Uh, commercial end and the rights-based end of fishing in, in Nova Scotia for, for all. Um, he's, very, he's been in power for uh, 20 years, uh, re-elected every uh, four years now, up until then it was two years based on the Indian Act. Um, and my presentation talked about uh, where we are now because the, the highlight in, in the agenda has talked about rebuilding. And for us, it, it hasn't really been a rebuilding. I, I don't think we've ever really lost our access to fish. We're fortunate enough that there's enough fish stock and, and uh, available fisheries, sustainable fisheries, that, that we're not or never were quite out of the fishery. Uh, I think it's important to uh, discuss you know, some of the acts that, that have led or, and court decisions. Uh, you know, Sparrow, number one, that, that led to food social ceremonial fishery, uh, you know, th which there's still a, a major decline on the food that's required to survive and sustain yourself uh, for indigenous communities, particularly the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, and what uh, is actually being harvested in these FSC agreements or AFS based agreements, because uh, the two are tied. Uh, in order to exercise your FSC, you have to sign with the FO your AFS agreements, and this sort of gives you what you will or will not do in order to obtain this FSC access. And, and the two are really uniquely defined and different. Uh, there's a funding package that comes with AFS, where you, here's your right to fish for food, social, ceremonial, social and ceremonial access, and they, they shouldn't be combined. And, and there's there seems to be a new change with DFO, at least in the Atlantic, that maybe they're going to move away from that, and I hope they do. Uh, again, <laughs> that wasn't covered in my talk. I'm, I'm getting a little off track. Uh, but then, then came Marshall, and Marshall is what established a uh, true, um, I guess it would be rebuilding, of uh, fisheries, at least commercial access, for the Mi'kmaq communities. Uh, for, I, I cited a chart uh, last week I used it, it was from APC, it was, uh, it's 10 years old now, it was from 2009. But Marshall decision came down in, in September of uh, 1999, so actually this September was 20 years anniversary. And there was a uh, meeting in member two that discussed you know, where we were, where we are. And it was funny, this, this chart I found last week, uh, actually I had another lecture, uh, described that in 1999 out of 32 then uh, First Nation communities, they held 300 licenses. In 2009, just 10 years later, after Marshall and Marshall Initiative, Marshall uh, uh, licenses being uh, negotiated and worked out, uh, that had grown to uh, 1,100 and change. And I, if I was to be a betting man, I would say now, you know, an additional 10 years later, we're probably sitting around. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we're at 2,500 licenses now amongst those 32, and and, and that's through the the economic return of some of these fisheries, you know, they, they were the more the lucrative fisheries. It was, you know, it was lobster, it was snow crab, it was, you know, licenses that have, you know, real market value today. Um, it's through different funding arrangements and, and uh, you know, uh, as you heard, loan banks and, and different structures like that, that have been set up, you know, ourselves, within ourselves and, and by ourselves with, with government intervention and academia, you know, things like Ulnaweg uh, is an amazing uh, financial resource, uh, provides uh, funding for 
Aboriginal businesses and Indigenous businesses, uh, particularly in Atlantic Canada, and it has nothing to do with fisheries uh, necessarily, but it's another avenue. Uh, there, there's now talk about us even potentially investing some of our fishing revenue into a, a fund there for, for new access and, and funding Aboriginal fishing interests as well. Uh, I don't know an awful lot about it, it's not my speciality, that's for sure. Um, but that one brought into you know that, that economic boom uh, that my communities have had probably since 2004, 2005. Uh, you know, and that's when I really started to see the holdings. I was part of licensing back then of DFO, and, and I, I saw the, the licenses that were held by the five communities I serve uh, in my current role. Um, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, the growth and and the expertise you know we hardly ever use um, non-indigenous skippers you know we're actually employing our own people to fish our licenses uh, you know to get the the experience and the training uh, to expand their horizons you know uh, just two weeks ago maybe three weeks ago I, I was reading an article in um, one of the news uh, casts and it then talked in fact it was CBC I believe uh, about the surf clam uh, temporary interim decision by the minister to allow Clearwater and the Mi'kmaq to work together on this surf clam plan. Well, uh, and we've included, it's not just the 13 bands, it actually includes the 14th band being Con River in Newfoundland, uh, and I probably should be using a specific term, but I, uh, <laughs> I'm good with my own five communities, I'm not so good for, with uh, other communities knowing their uh, non-English term, uh, so I apologize for that, but uh, it just goes to show even there that uh, you know, there's growth and, and, and encouragement of moving forward, uh, you know, our commercial capacity. Uh, the, the last piece is the moderate livelihood, and, and that too was tied into the martial licenses. And, uh, and again, there's four distinct licenses in Atlantic Canada. There's commercial licenses, which anyone can, you know, meeting certain criteria can go and access, so I personally could do it myself. Uh, it's not a big deal to, to get the, uh, the license. It's, it's expensive, don't get me wrong, which is why we're hearing from the young harvesters in BC about the access fees are, are you know, exorbitant, especially for a young man, you know, maybe uh, not the best credit uh, to come up with millions, potentially millions of dollars to buy into the larger fisheries. Uh, but that's generally what you would need to do is you just have to you know check a few boxes off and uh, have the, the the previous experience and you could become a registered full-time fisherman and, and start gaining access um, the other piece and, and this the fourth fourth piece after commercial is uh, well <laughs> second is uh, is your commun commercial communal which is similar licenses it's what the indigenous communities that I represent hold. Uh, that's your access to do exactly what the non-indigenous harvesters do. You go out with a certain set of requirements and regulations, certain trap limits, certain season dates, and that's what you fish. You know, so, so for example, it's lobster. In LFA 27, for example, the non-indigenous fish 275 licenses, uh, 275 traps. We on our commercial communal licenses fish the same 275 traps. There's no increase, there's no decrease. The season dates are generally uh, May 15th until July 15th. We follow all those same rules. You know, vessel requirements, everything's basically the same. Uh, however, then you get into the third type of licenses, that's FSC. That's your rights base. That's based on the Sparrow decision. That's that you're permitted to harvest as much fish as you need to satisfy the food requirements of your community. Now, sadly, with the FSC agreements, they're not quite where they should be. They're, they're actually quite low. Some communities are starting to expand upon them, and, and I'm hoping that someday they actually may you know, be at least somewhat more than what they are now and, and actually begin to actually feed communities. Right now, when you're talking the amount of lobster and, and such that are being taken from the waters, particularly off Nova Scotia, it's less than 1% of the commercial harvest. It's, it's a bit of a joke. Um, then you get into moderate livelihood. Moderate livelihood is the new license. It's not been defined yet, and that's why there's been such a, a protest fishery that's been going on in Southwest Nova and other areas in, in uh, the Maritime region uh, and, and uh, Gulf region as well, because this was undefined by the, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, they really thought the politicians and perhaps the, the leadership of, of the uh, indigenous communities would have gotten together and, and mapped out a uh, negotiated settlement as to what moderate livelihood means, you know, how many pounds, how many licenses, how many boats, you know, all those items have to be discussed and interpreted and, and decided upon. Um, you know, in the last government, uh, prior to the recent election, had actually suggested and, and appointed a lead negotiator and even his work um, to date has been rejected uh, by our chiefs. I was rather surprised I walked into a public meeting um, 
probably two months ago, and one of our lead chiefs were there. In fact, I allowed him to sit at the table instead of myself. I took the uh, observer's chair and uh, let him speak because, he, you know, out of respect, at the very least, he should be at the table. And he came right out and he said, you know, I want DFO to hear this right from our, my mouth. And that was, we're not negotiating. We're, we're not prepared. We're not uh, interested in advancing. Um, because it, 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 it had a framework to it. It was, it, it will be this way. It wouldn't be necessarily the way that, that the communities feel. It, it, it's a, it's a bio, it, it's, it's, it's shut up money. And, and um, our chiefs through their wisdom have decided, you know what, this is not in our best interest at this time to move on this. Uh, now maybe because of this, you know, this strong statement, maybe this will allow for, for true negotiation to take place, and I hope it is. Um, but our chiefs are so advanced because of the potential fear of someone getting hurt or, or injured uh, in the protest fishery, they've actually uh, begun to have meetings internally with the uh, non-Indigenous fleets and, and uh, the leadership of those fleets to try to find a, uh, a, a calm and reasonable approach to discussing where we go and how we get there and, and what it means and to make sure that you know they hear the message or they get the message that they can deliver to their um, organization and make sure that the leadership can, can downplay any rumors or wharf talk that, that may lead to those violent confrontations or you know burning of vessels or, or you know physical harm or threats of harm that, that are happening right now as we speak. Um, you know, I was in Ottawa last week and, and I was told numerous times that, oh, you know, you guys do that, we're going to do that instead. And, and you know, that's, that's not a, a welcoming atmosphere for, for Indigenous people to be a part of. Uh, you know, <laughs> some may, may welcome it because some may take it on a challenge and say, well, if that's what you want. Um, you know, m myself, I, I would rather us have a you know, wholesome conversation, although it may be uncomfortable. To talk about it and, and funny I was talking uh, at this meeting actually it was the, the post meeting it was the, it was the celebration afterwards and, and uh, I was talking to a, a group of the individuals and, and my local MP Jaime Batiste walked up and, and he actually sitting on FOPO he's, uh, he's part of the uh, committee and uh, his thesis he's a lawyer uh, by education and uh, was on moderate livelihood and he spoke to a bunch of uh, opponents and proponents on, on different treaty-based rights and, and uh, livelihoods discussions. And he, he urged the people I was talking to and trying to calm down and, and be open-minded to write him as a member of FOPO saying that we'll discuss moderate livelihood within the next two years. And, and I thought, wow. Now, I think that may be ambitious, you know, a two-year you know, turnover from committee to, to actual uh, uh, action items, but at least there's hope. Uh, you know that the conversation is being had, and he was open enough to, to you know to, to tell these guys to send me your position. I want to hear them. I want to know what it means to Gaspé Z and and uh, you know Shediac and 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 Cape Breton and Inganish and you know all these different fishing ports. You know how does that affect your uh, fishing uh, livelihoods and and your your employment levels and your historic values and and your debt load because that, that's the thing that. We, we don't see necessarily. We don't realize that you know someone may have just purchased a lobster license for two or three million dollars in Southwest Nova, and all of a sudden there's now new access being given for free in, in their minds to indigenous groups. So if you're not having a wholesome conversation, you know that poor guy is going home every night and wondering, you know, if they're giving away a third of my license or a half of my license, how do I ever maintain myself, and and how do I you know keep in this home and this community and and those are questions that are real and important uh, and have to be discussed and this this cooperation between the members of the KMK and all which is our uh, our uh, treaty negotiators if they actually continue to meet with the fleets and have this wholesome discussion I think that peace will be maintained uh, there may be some hurt feelings at times through the negotiations and discussions on both sides but at least it's advancing, uh, you know, the, the, the capacity for everyone involved and, and the knowledge of everyone involved, so that you know there's no rumors causing you know loss or loss of life or, or personal injury to anyone. Um, so that's a, an important key. Uh, I think I ended on uh, discussions with, with the with the department. Uh, you know, sometimes common sense isn't your best friend. Uh, you know, it, it's here. Here's a you know amendment and, and discussion we're having now in BC on on the. Uh, the uh, committee work 
on uh, the BC model and, and cor correcting the, the uh, licensing policy versus the Atlantic and, and or the Eastern. And, and true enough, it, it needs to be done, it needs to be done with, with working with the Indigenous participation. Uh, don't be working on separate sides. You need non-Indigenous, Indigenous, academia, even some corporate members, if they're trusted, in the same room talking. Because if not, uh, it will turn around that certain groups of DFO or, or the lobbyists will target certain groups of DFO and say, well, there's another story you're missing, there's another story you're missing, and all of a sudden we'll be at odds. So if it's us against the First Nations and, and it's the First Nations against the corporate and then it's another you know, ENGO or what have you with a different opinion, there's four wars going on. You can't win that one. If you're going to have a war, have it, as I said yesterday, with the corporate fleet. Uh, and that's really Jim, James Patterson. I mean, if you don't pull down his empire, you know, lop off 25% right off the top. That's the new access. That's what, you know, if, if nothing else, give that to the First Nation or, or give 15% of that to the First Nations out here to begin starting to rebuild their fishery. And that other 10%, give that to the young BC fishermen to start building capacity so that the communities that they live in in the rural coastlines of BC can maintain themselves and, and keep uh, you know, the, the, the property values uh, you know, in BC at a, a reasonable sta state because we're not being forced to move from the rural coastline into center uh, mainland and, and Vancouver. Allow us to live where we were traditionally born and bred. I mean, Corky raised it last night in his example, you know, our hearts are there. It's, it's our backyard that we think about because that's where we have history. Uh, think a little broader, think of BC as a whole. And, and you said you've got the biggest fishing uh, industry coast to coast out here. Let's respect it and, and move on it.